That is happening the ninth, and again, to be around the people of God and what God is doing, for me, is so incredibly exciting. It's so exciting to be around folks to where the Lord is just moving, moving, moving in their lives. Man, I kind of want to rub up to them and say, you know, put a little bit of on me, too, because I want to experience that. I want that in my life as well. So, again, the missions lunch, missions, also the baptisms happening. Well, Let's get into the Word this morning. We're beginning a new chapter in the Gospel of Luke this morning. If any of you needs a Bible, I would sure like you to raise your hand because we are going through the first 21 verses this morning. And, um, and so with that, uh, as you're opening your Bibles, I'd like to invite um, a young lady up to the stage this morning. So come on up here. To, oh, both of you guys, both you guys. They're flipping the script here on me. So this is Tiffany and this is Destiny. Say hi to everybody. And there you go. They're going to share with you something that I have no idea what they're going to share with you. You're going to share on camp, right? Yes. Okay, and you're going to... Oh, you're in the... Sc- oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. We had a couple of, of youth go to junior high camp this, um, this last week and they had a blessed time. Yeah, you had a blessed time? Yes. Okay, there you go. That's the answer I want to hear. So with that, I'm going to let Tiffany go ahead and speak. Amen. So, Tiffany, what did God show you? Um, just to, like, uplift everybody and just to kind of, like, include everybody and just to, like, um, just to unify the body and, like, keep everybody together and stuff. All right. Now, you don't have to answer this, but don't answer it. But I'm sure there's somebody you don't like <laughs> on this world, right? In this world. Not in Williamsburg. Are you going to pray for them? That's one of the things that spoke to me is just to pray for people you don't like. Pray for people that an- annoy you and just get on your nerves and stuff. Because just to like for your relationship with them and just to like, not to be like best friends, but to like have that common goal of, of Christ and stuff. You just kind of never know what God's going to do huh, from that point on. So, so you know, uh, it's funny that you're talking about that because today I'm going to be speaking about a little bit about prayer in chapter 8 and how, you know, I don't believe that prayer changes things. But what I believe is that prayer changes me. And, uh, and we're going to talk about faith and how faith changes things. But prayer changes me. So prayer is going to change you, huh? Mm-hmm. And you too, Destiny? <laughs> Amen. Well, let me pray for them. Can I? And there was another young man, Glenn, um, who couldn't be up here right now, but um, he also went. And I'm sure the Lord has shared with his mom and dad exactly what God had done and, uh, with him. And uh, what a great, great theme, unity. Man, unity in the body of Christ. It's so important, is it not? It's so important. Let me pray for for them this morning. So Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for Tiffany. I thank you for Destiny. I thank you for Glenn. Lord, I pray that as we, as Destiny read that verse and uh, Tiffany and Glenn were able to be a participant up there at camp, that God, that you will continue to move in their young lives, Lord. That, Lord, that you will show them that, yes, it may be difficult, but, Lord, you tell us to to love those who don't love us. And Lord, it's so easy to love those or to like those who who like us. But Lord, um, you call us to a greater calling and that is one of sacrifice. And Lord, thank you that through Tiffany's example, Lord, and through Glenn, through Destiny here, that, that Lord God, that you will demonstrate through their young lives, Lord, that certainly with Jesus, everything is possible. Even when we don't like someone, Lord, that, Lord, you call us to pray for them, Lord. Oh, help me in that, Lord, because I'm convicted right now as a result of, of, of that. And so, Lord, um, help all of us, Lord, get over ourselves and get into the things of Christ. Bless these young guys and gals, Lord, who have gone to camp from all the different Calvaries in the area up at YDI. 
May it be lasting, Lord, in their lives. And then so they get to look forward to the next camp and the next theme and the next work that you'll do. And may not the work that you've implanted in their hearts um, stop when they came down the, the mountaintop. But Lord, may it continue on and mature them and grow them in Christ. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You're welcome. All right. It is so cool to go to camp. I get to go to camp on the, 20, on the 17th to the 21st. No, it's not pastor's camp. It's actually the youth camp. So I'm excited to go with our youth group up there, and so um, it'll be a lot of fun. All right. What did I say we're at? Luke chapter 8? Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 this morning. The end of chapter 7, Jesus speaks to a sinner. We can surmise from the scriptures and from that word that this sinner was most likely and probably a prostitute, a harlot. But this prostitute was totally heartbroken. She was totally heartbroken because Jesus tells her that her sins are forgiven. He says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. I want you to notice at the end of chapter 7 that Jesus didn't say, although this woman demonstrated great love for Jesus, that it was not her love. Jesus didn't say, well, your love has saved you. Jesus, though, commended her for her love. He said in verse 44 of chapter 7, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman anointed my feet with fragrant oil. It was her love that was astonishing and incredible, but it was her faith that saved her. Her love was demonstrated by the very fact that the tears fell from her face and fell upon the feet of Jesus, and then it was her hair that she dried his feet with. And although she showed an incredible love for Jesus, and she was commended by her love for him, Jesus did say finally, your faith has saved you. Because it's not love that saves, but it's faith. Paul says also in Galatians, however, faith works by love. True faith, understand this, listen up, true faith will always show up in tender love. If a person truly has faith in the Lord, it will show in a love for the Lord. And if a person truly has love for the Lord, it will show in faith towards the Lord. Faith works by love, says Paul. Faith and love are incredibly closely connected, however. They go hand in hand, yet there are common misconceptions, I think, about both love and both and faith. People say, well, love is blind. People say, faith is blind. But I tell you, this isn't true. Because it's because love sees more that it sees less. Love is not blind. Love sees more, but because love sees more, it is willing to see less. 
The account in chapter 7, Simon the Pharisee, one of the other players in that account, sees this woman and what she is doing, and he says, this man, if he were a prophet speaking of Jesus, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Simon saw this woman in her present sin. But Jesus saw her in her future sanctification or her future sanctity. Simon saw her in the present. Jesus, I say to you, saw her in the future. That's love in my book. Love doesn't see less. It sees more. So because love sees more, it is willing to see less. When you love someone, it doesn't mean that you are blind to their faults. When you love someone, you are able to see beyond their faults to their potential. I think about that every day with my own children, my own boys, one of which is up here doing worship and one of which is up in Lynchburg. And as I see their lives as young boys maturing into young men, sure, do they do stupid things as young boys? Absolutely. Do they, they say do things or say things? I'm like, where did you get that from? What were you thinking? I'm not blind to the mistakes and errors they've made in their lives. Because I love them. I see more. And so because I see more, because of my love, I'm willing to see less. You see beyond their faults, don't you? You see into the potential of their future. And also, when you see beyond their faults as Christians... You then see them in their future position in Christ. You don't see them just in their faults, but you see them beyond their faults. Love sees more because it's willing to see less. The Apostle Paul says, I look at no man in the flesh. It's an awesome verse. Paul says, I look at no man in the flesh, meaning I see every man in the spirit. You follow me? Paul says, I see them in their position in Christ. I see them not in their present state, but in their potential in heaven. Ultimately, Paul then says, so I can love them. I can love them. Because I'm not looking at them on how they are today, but I'm looking at them on how they are going to be in the future. And I think that's so important. I see them in the future, not because I'm aware of their shortcomings presently in front of me, or not because I'm aware of their, their, their failures practically, but because I see more than where they are now. More than where they are in their present state. Because I see more in the future of what they can be and what they will be. Therefore, I see them positionally in Christ. I see them spotless and blameless 
in Christ's love. So the key to love is to see more. When you see more, you are willing to see less. Love is not blind. Love sees more. And because it's willing to see more, it sees less. So to faith. People say that you have a blind faith. Not so. Not true. Faith sees more like love sees more. The man or the woman of faith sees more. The world, people who lack faith, say, if I can see it, well, then I will believe it. That's the world. Yet the Christian who has faith, that is you and me in this room, because he or she believes it, he will see it. See, that's the difference. The world says, I'll believe it when I see it. The Word says, believe it and you will see it. That's what the Word says. And that's to be your life and my life in Christ. One pastor says this, and I think it's really, really cool. I stole it from him. He's speaking about a man and woman of faith and what faith is and why faith, as it kind of hit me, it's like, well, this is kind of like what I'm teaching on today. And it's something I pulled up a long time ago and in my little files, I look at things on faith, little anecdotes or little sayings or this and that. And this is one that I think is very appropriate about faith and what faith sees because I'm saying as love sees more, faith sees more. Said by this man, the faith of a man and a woman of faith, that a man or woman of faith sees the invisible, that a man or woman of faith hears the inaudible, That a man or woman of faith believes the incredible so that that man or woman of faith can do the impossible. Pretty cool, I think. I didn't say it. I wish I had. But I didn't. A man or woman of faith sees the invisible, hears the inaudible, believes the incredible, so they can do the impossible. That's faith. That's why faith sees more. You and I, we can pray all day as far as things happening. And as I said earlier, you know, there's that bumper sticker that says, prayer makes things happen. Faith makes things happen. Prayer changes things. Well, I submit to you that faith is the thing that changes things. Because as I said, you can pray all day. You can pray all day long. But it's when you exercise your faith is when things are going to happen. Sitting in your prayer closet is awesome. Do it, do it, do it. But it's when you get out of your prayer closet and you begin doing what God has instructed you to do or what you know what he's, what he's telling you to do, you're to do in obedience. That's the faith. That's movement. That's action. Faith changes things. Prayer, prayer is a way that your faith and my faith is honed. Prayer is a way that my faith is developed and I grow. Prayer is a way of taking in the Word. Prayer is a way of submitting yourself to the will of God. When you pray to God, And you say, Lord, change me. When you pray to God and you bow in your heart before him and you say, Lord, use me. 
Lord, fill me. You're bowing before his presence. And prayer is a thing that changes you and me. And it is faith that makes things happen. Hebrews 11.6 tells us this. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The grain of a mustard seed, the Bible tells us, can move a mountain. Faith and love, they go hand in hand. Faith sees more. The end of chapter 7 The reason why I'm speaking to you about all of this is because chapter 7 ends on the same note of which chapter 8 is all about. Chapter 8 is divided into two sections. Verses 1 through 21 speaks about faith, the teaching of faith, the understanding of faith. Verses 22 to the end of the chapter, 56, is, is, tells us about the testing of our faith. Jesus teaches, instructs, and brings understanding of what faith is in the first half of the chapter. The second half of the chapter, then Jesus shows us the testing of that faith. Teaching about faith, Jesus speaks on hearing the word. We're going to read some parables and some accounts on hearing the word of God. The second half, the testing of faith, pertains specifically to the heeding of God's word. You have the hearing of God's word and you have the heeding of God's word. Very important facets in the life of a Christian. Hearing the word, heeding the word means doing it. It's quite one way to hear the word of God and believe the word of God, but it's another thing to actually do it, fulfill it out in your life. It takes faith, does it not? To know that you know yourself better than anybody, yet God is telling you something that you need to overcome, that you need to gain victory over. It's done by faith. Verse 1 begins this way. Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village preaching and bringing glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the twelve were with him. This is such a great opening to this chapter. The glad tidings of the kingdom of God. Jesus went teaching and he went preaching. The good news, the glad tidings, not preaching or teaching doom and gloom. These common folks, they gathered around him, hearing the good news, the glad tidings about the kingdom of God. Jesus is the one to tell them of the good news. What is the good news? Well, I believe, you may have different thoughts, but I believe as I narrow it down to one word, I think it's about forgiveness. Jesus teaches forgiveness. His life is demonstrated. His death is illustrated by forgiveness. Because you and I have been forgiven our sins. That's it. That's the good news. No psychiatrist, no psychologist can ever give that to anyone who goes in to see them 
All they ask for is, how do you feel about that? I don't know. I'm paying you the money. You should tell me how I feel, right? I don't have the degree. You do. Tell me. Well, that's their whole idea. Their whole idea is for you to figure it out yourself and then deal with it. But God says, hey, listen, I already know all about you. And you are forgiven. Let me take that from you instead of dealing with it. There's freedom in that. And that's the glad tidings that Jesus Christ teaches about the good news. He's teaching forgiveness. All of your mess-ups. I know if I think about my mess-ups, I've got a load of them. Just ask my wife. I've messed up big time on things. I've blown it hugely in areas of my life. But I know that uh, all of those things are forgiven by God. Salvation, redemption, gives these people and gives you and me a provision for failure. No other person, no other religion does that except Christianity through Jesus Christ. He gives you and me a provision for failure. Think about that. When you fail, is that it? No, that's not it. But you can go to God and you can ask forgiveness. You can repent and your sin is forgiven. See, that's what Jesus is all about. Forgiveness. Glad tidings, folks. Your sins are forgiven. That's the glad news. That's the glad tidings that we know and believe in from our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, there's only one sin that's not ever forgiven, and that is the sin of blasphemy. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit the rejecting of the work of Christ, that the Scriptures tell us is the only unpardonable sin. That's for another time. Verses 2 and 3, it goes on to say, A certain woman who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chuzza, Herod's steward, And Susanna, many others who provided for him, that being Jesus, from their substance. So Jesus is going out, he's preaching, he's teaching the glad tidings, and he's bringing all of this good news to the ears of the people around him. And there are these women who are alongside Jesus. They're kind of a part of the ministry team, if you kind of want to look at at it that way. Ministry helpers. The 12 you can look at were like maybe the ministry leaders, but these particular women were the helpers of the ministry. They could not be a part of the 12, but they can certainly be a part of the ministry itself. Amen? I like these women. Because you see, they come from different stages or different levels of their lives. It is only God that can bring together Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and this woman Susanna. Mary Magdalene the lowest of lows according to the times and the culture. Joanna, one of Herod's steward, one that was kind of high society as was Susanna. And it's only God that could bring the people together for the work of the ministry from different stages of life. And I like these women because... It's not like they said, well, since I can't be part of the 12, forget it. Forget it. 
If I can't be part of the 12, if I can't be considered an apostle, well then, uh, forget it. I'm not going to serve. No, they didn't do that. Instead of seeing what they could not do, they focused on what they could do. I like that. Because women have such an important key role practically in the service, in the ministry of the church. Also, it's kind of interesting to me, when you look at all the attacks upon Jesus, when you look at all the hassles that were given our Lord, were any of them by a woman? No. They weren't. I like that. Just the men. Just the men. And there's issues, you know. I mean, there's issues with men. There's issues with women. And you look at the area of leadership. You look at the emotional situation of ladies at times. And you look at the stubbornness of men. And hey, the emotion part is great at times. And the stubbornness is also great at times. But men had ordained the men to be in the leadership in the church. But the women play such an important, vital role, especially in this church. I look at our folks that serve, be it on staff or those who are serving and alongside the ministry leaders, and I praise the Lord for the ladies in this church because they add something so special to the ministry. They add tenderness. They add understanding. They add compassion. And many times, wow, the ladies are way more spirit-filled than the guys, let me tell you. I go, I never thought of that. That was good. You know, let's do that. And God has his role for the man. But if you're in a marriage relationship... The two are to work side by side, uplifting one another, encouraging one another. As the woman has been given a helpmate unto the man, the man is to be the leader of the home, and the woman is to be the helpmate, submitting unto his authority as he submits unto God. That's the way it works. That's biblical. Also interesting to me is that, you know, Jesus didn't need these women. He didn't need this para-ministry to come alongside the, the men. Jesus, in all of his divinity, could have just, no problem, snapped his fingers or made a thought and a buffet, a smorgasbord, a bunch of food with him all the time. Or also he could have snapped his fingers or thought a thought in the money bag that would have been replenished and filled But he didn't do that. Why? Well, I submit to you, and I believe that Jesus, not only does he know the understanding and the value of giving, as Jesus is a giver, but Jesus also understands the value of receiving. Jesus is not like, well, you know what, we don't need this, ladies. But he understood how valuable it was to receive and to allow these women to help in the ministry alongside the 12 and alongside Jesus. How big is his heart, I believe, to receive from his own children. And that's you and me. Receiving of offerings and praise unto Jesus. Verses 4 through 11. When a great multitude had gathered, they had come in to him from every city. He spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And as he trampled and was trampled down. And the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Verse 7, some fell on thorns, 
And the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears, let him hear. When then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to, sh- to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Very important note. But to the rest it is given in parables that, seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand, referring to I- Isaiah's writings. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Jesus now proceeds to tell and describe the four types of soil. One could also, as you may know, look at this as four types of the heart. Four hearts, four soil. The seed being the word of God. And as it falls on this soil or on these hearts... What's going to happen? That's the question. And Jesus gives us four examples of this whole process. Jesus says that parables are for those who want to know and those who don't. Jesus will reveal the truth always to those who want to know the truth. And in that Isaiah quote, Jesus will conceal the truth to those who do not want to know it. That's what that means. If you want to see Jesus, if you want to see him, all you need to do is to ask and he'll reveal himself to you in a very powerful way. That's all you need. But if you don't want to see Jesus, guess what? He's going to go, okay. No problem. It's just that simple. Because the Lord won't force Himself upon anyone who doesn't want Him. Jesus could have persuaded, quote unquote, through His words or to get them to believe. He could have done that really easily. Or He could have used through guilt or fear or wonders or miracles, but that's not Jesus. That's not who our Lord is. That's Islam. Conversion by the sword. That's forced love. Pushing himself upon other people. But Jesus loves and honors people. And if you don't want the truth, guess what, gang? He'll conceal it from you. If you don't want me, says Jesus, then I will conceal myself from you. This tells me that Jesus will not force himself upon me either, even as a believer. If I read his word, if I hear from him, and I don't want to do it, he says, okay, okay, no problem. If I don't want to know the truth, if I don't want to listen to God, I won't see what he wants to show me. Then, prayerfully, after so many times of messing up, after blowing it, falling down, then I will finally see and understand. In verse 11, Jesus says about this parable, the seed is the word Of God. Peter said, We are born not of uncorruptible seed. We're not born of of, we are born not of uncorruptible seed, one that is not corrupt, one that is not of sin. Do you want to be more like Jesus? Do you want to have more peace? Do you want to have more joy in your heart? And do you want more of a radiance flowing out from your life? Then the way is real simple. It's done by the planting of the seed of the Lord. 
And when you think about that, when you look at that, it's almost like, you know, in the, in the context of the Scripture and the word that's being used, it's, it's like an impregnation that's happening. And that seed of which gives life in a human, for a human, is likened to the seed that gives life when it's laid upon the heart. That's what we're talking about. It's not enough, I believe, just to say you want to be more like Jesus. Oh, I want to be more like Him. I I want to walk in His ways. I want these things. But when the seed, the Word of God, is impregnated into your heart, your soul, and your life, is when it happens. It's not so much just to come to church or to go to Bible study. But you and I, we need to be in the seed. We need to be in the Word of God. Verse 12, it says, those by the wayside are the ones who hear, and the devil comes and takes away the Word out of their hearts. Jesus now explains the parables. They should believe, and be, lest they should believe and be saved. Verse 13, but the one on the rock are those who hear, receive the word with joy, and those and these have no root, who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. Verse 14, now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are the ones who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. The word tells us that the seed is the word of God, the birds is the devil. And speaks about those on the wayside, which is that walked upon ground, that, that walkway to where the birds come and the devil takes the word out of their heart. The second one is when they hear. I want you to notice that in every one of these, they hear the word. They hear it. But the one on the rock are those who, when they hear, they receive it with joy. And these have no root and believe for a while and in time of temptation, they fall away. So they hear it. They receive it. Lord, thank you with joy. But there's no root. There's a belief for a little while, but then when the trials and the tribulations come and the winds come and they blow, guess what? They fall away. Or a time of temptation, like the Scripture says, a time of temptation to where they're going to follow that. How's your study life in the Word of God? Is your study life hit and miss? Is your study life sporadic? Is your worship waning? Is your prayer hit and miss? As we see verse 13 and we see verse 6, which are the correlating verses, it all results from a lack of moisture. Now, it's not so much the moisture that's the issue, though. But the issue is there is no root There's no depth in your relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no depth to get the moisture. See, that's why Jesus says there's no moisture because the roots are not deep enough to get to the moisture, to get to that. Jesus says, hey, your root system is shallow. It's shallow. There's no depth. 
Jesus wants us to have a deep, fulfilling relationship with him. And that requires us to get into the word, to worship our Lord, to pray so that we will not fall away because of no roots. In verse 14, now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who when they have heard go out and choked with cares, riches, pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. The cares. The cares of not enough money. The cares of too much money. What to do with it. What to do with pleasures of life. How do I please myself? Those are the cares of which Jesus is speaking about. Cares, riches, pleasures of life brings no fruit to maturity. These are the kind of areas that will indeed choke out the word of God from your life. Too much money being caught up and concerned with that care. Not enough money, so then you're taking on two and three jobs because of the care of not having enough and possibly not trusting in the Lord. How do I please myself? See, with all of these cares in your life, Jesus says, you leave no room for me. You leave no room for the seed of God to be implanted upon your heart. And in verse 15, I think is very important as we read that, the last part of it is that the idea is to bear fruit, but by patience. That you trust over time, and in time, it will bear fruit. Someone brought us veggies yesterday to our house. And these vegetables are like, whoa, those are vegetables. Healthy looking and a lot of great color to them. Really, really, really nice and really awesome. But I know they didn't happen overnight. I know they didn't put a seed in the ground and all of a sudden, pop, we got this wonderful looking veggie, right? It doesn't work that way. But it takes time and it takes patience. How many of us are so quick? Oh, I want this. Oh, I think the Lord's leading me here. Oh, I think we're going to do this. Boom, boom, boom. But you're not allowing fruit to be, to grow, to be bearing in your life because you have no patience. Jesus says, on the good soil, you've heard the word, you've got a noble, which means good heart. Keep it, the word, and bear fruit with patience. Patience, slowing down. If you say, well, gee, I've gone to church five times now and nothing's happening in my life. Or I'm going to Bible study and I didn't feel anything. Or man, I'm finally tithing, but yet I'm still not being blessed. What's going on, God? Patience. What does it mean? It means hopeful. It means endurance. It means consistency. It means waiting. Hopeful, endurance, consistency, Waiting. And you know what the first word is on this definition in the Greek? I left it to the last. Cheerful. Go figure that. So now let's look at it this way. You're cheerfully hopeful. You're cheerfully enduring. You're cheerfully consistent. You're cheerfully waiting. Get the picture? Cheerfully not all humdrum, not all like, Lord, what's going on, man? Being impatient. Lord, why aren't you yet doing this work in my life? What is going on? As if it's his fault, huh? How are you to bear fruit in your life? Have a good heart. 
have a cheerful enduring, a cheerful waiting, a cheerful hope of the work that Jesus is going to do in your life. In closing, up to 21, it says, No one, has, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand, and those who enter may see the light. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Verse 18, Therefore take heed how you hear. For whoever has to him, more will be given. Whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. Then his mother and brothers came to him and could not approach him because of the crowd. And it was told him by some who said, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are these who what? Who hear the word of God and do it. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the word of God. By allowing the seed to fall on the good and patient, cheerful soil of your heart. In the Old Testament, in the Old, I'm sorry, in the King James Version of this account of the family of Jesus waiting When it speaks of a crowd standing outside, the word used is press. It gives us kind of maybe an understanding or a thought like maybe there was a lot of pressing going on or pressure or maybe even some commentators, which I can't believe it, they actually say, well, Jesus was a little bit stressed out here. He was a little bit pressed so he just kind of was kind of flipping out a little bit and like, well, who are my mothers and brothers? You know, it's those who hear the word of God and do it. Come on, come on. You know, that kind of a thing. Oh, I don't buy that at all. Our Lord is never pressed. Our Lord is never stressed. God knows exactly what's happening. But the word gives to us and denotes to us that there is a closing in of people around Jesus. They are closing in. They want Jesus Terribly much. His response? Who is my family? I think about now in 2011, who is my family? I thought about that. Who is my family? All of the Calvary Chapel, Williamsburg. They're my family. You're my family. You're my family and you and I together, we're taking in the Word, and we're working out the Word together. My family are the ones who hear the Word and do the Word. Now next week, stay tuned. They've heard the Word. They've heard the seed. It's been planted. Teachings about faith and how it takes root and bears fruit patiently. They have been schooled by Jesus and they've heard everything he has to say. The next week, what they've heard about faith will now be tested. It'll be tested. Next week, Faith being the anchor and the key to the calming storms. Faith being the key and the anchor to beating the devil. And faith being the key and the anchor to solving problems. It's all faith. It's all faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time, Lord. Thank you for this day that... We've been able to partake of communion with you, Lord. That we've been able to, once again, Lord, have the oneness, the koinonia with you, God. The unity with you, Lord. Thank you for the time of worship, God, that we had. That, Lord, I pray, opens us up and makes us vulnerable for you, the Holy Spirit, to be able to work things out in our lives. 
Lord, we have heard much about faith today. We have heard much about love today, Lord. And how love sees everything and is willing to see less. And how faith is that action that allows us to move forward in our life. Lord, we've heard about faith this morning. May we not just be hearers, but may we be doers, Lord. No matter the difficulty, no matter the situation. Help us, Lord, in the working out of our salvation. Hearing the word and working the word out in our lives. It's not easy. But with God, all things are possible, you tell us. And I have the faith to believe what you tell me. So, Lord, bless everyone here this morning. May this message resonate in their hearts and in their minds about where they are in the area of faith and where they will be at the time of testing. May they show themselves approved by you, Lord. May they stand firm. So, Lord, we thank you. We praise you. I pray for blessings upon everyone here. I pray, God, that they go and they grow in the grace and they go in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And all God's people say, amen.